welcome to this Agilent Technologies recorded webcast. We hope you find this webcast both interesting and valuable. If after viewing this recording you are interested in more, go to Agilent TM webcast YouTube channel for more recordings or sign up for one of our upcoming live sessions at www.agilent.com slash find slash web underscore seminars. Now, over to the presenter. Today's topic, Korean detection of polarization multiplexed and different phase modulated optical signals. Uh, I will give a brief uh, agenda of today's talk. So first, after a short introduction on the topic, what is polarization multiplexing, I will give you a few uh, slides on complex modulation and complex modulation, how it increases the efficiency of uh, signal transmission, of digital uh, transmission. I will then introduce uh, a little bit of math and uh, physics, how signals propagate on signal mode fiber, and introduce a little bit of uh, Jones calculus. And after that, I'll give you a short introduction on coherent versus direct detection, how this affects uh, the signals you can receive, and how this affects the measurement hardware. Then I will show how the instrument to measure these signals uh, could look like. And uh, we have just recently on OFC introduced an instrument that can do this. I will then uh, switch over to an important uh, algorithm that is needed to decode these signals, uh, which is called channel matrix estimation. I will then show a few measurement examples and finally uh, end up with a short conclusion. So fundamental directions a network right now takes. Of course, reducing cost being cost effective is always an issue. And uh, for tunnel integration and power consumption are a few uh, things people look at. Of course, also people look into flexibility, switching the optical domain and all optical network. So they are looking at the reconfigurable optical adrop multiplexers, tunable transponders. But the topic is uh, in this area. So it's all about capacity and speed, how we really can uh, support the increase in traffic we are seeing in the networks. And uh, traffic is still growing, especially in the 40 and 100 gigabit per second transmission uh, speed. People are talking about advanced and complex modulation techniques, and polarization multiplexing is uh, one means to increase the efficiency of transmission of digital information. So very briefly, how complex modulation really works. So all you want to do, of course, is uh, transmit a binary bit stream. So in case of a QPSK signal, which is uh, depicted here, the binary bit stream is demultiplexed into two bit streams, half of the uh, bit rate. So there's a bit stream up here and a bit stream down there. Then there is a laser that serves as a carrier for the transmission of the signals. Then the binary bit stream is uh, amplified. So you have an analog signal. And these analog signals for the demultiplex bit streams are then encoded using a, a double mass sender structure. So there's one mass sender modulator over here, and there's another one down here. There's another pi half phase shifter so that the, both um, bit streams coming out, signals coming out of the sender modulators are shifted by a pi half with uh, respect to each other. And then those two signals are combined, so you end up with a QPSK signal. So looking into detail what is coming out of the first mass sender structure, in case of a one, there's a cosine uh, phase. So you start up here and go down there. And then if you switch from the one to the zero, there's a 180 degree phase shift. And if you stay from the zero to the zero, there's no phase shift down here. And then if you switch from zero to one, there's another 180 degree phase shift up here. That's the upper arm of the modulate structure. And in the lower arm, you start with a one again, but this time you have a sign because of the 90 degree phase shift up here. And switching from one to zero, there's another 180 degree phase shift. So it's a minus sign, another 180 degree phase shift plus sign. So if you add up those two, which you do up here in the, in, in the modulator structure, you end up using, seeing these waveforms coming out of, out of the modulator. So there's a 1, 1, then there's a transition to a 0, 0, which is in the constellation diagram from upper right corner to lower left corner. The constellation diagram is an easy means to uh, visualize uh, the constellation or the phase of the signals. So you could look at this as the in phase and the quadrature signals. And so in this case, you have a 45 degree phase, which is exactly what you have here. And then if you transition from 1, 1 to 0, 0, 
you have the phase shift of 180 degrees. And then from 0, 0 to 0, 1, you have a phase shift of 90 degrees, which is what you see here. And from 0, 1 to 1, 0, you have again a 180 degree phase shift, which is what you see here. So polarization division multiplexing, uh, it's all about uh, increasing spectral efficiency. Since the optical wave is a transverse electrical, uh, electromagnetic wave, you can split this into two orthogonal polarizations. And you can modulate the signal on each of these polarizations. That's why you can uh, carry an independent signal on each of these two uh, polarizations. Therefore, you can look at the fiber as if it had two virtual channels to transmit uh, basically two of the signals. At the receiver, then, you can split the signals again into two polarizations and recover the original uh, information sent out from the transmitter. So, bottom line, the Polarization division multiplexing, PDM, increases the spectral efficiency by a factor of two. It's depicted down here. So you have your well-known WDM channels. You have one channel in the Y polarization. And at the same wavelength, you can send a different signal on the X polarization. That's why you have the increasement of a factor of two. So what does that mean for the spectrum of the transmitted signal? If you start out using a classical on-off keying signal, in this case, it's 112 gigabit per second uh, spectrum uh, centered around the optical carrier. You have a spectrum that's basically two times uh, the uh, bit rate of your transmission. So it's 224 gigahertz wide the spectrum until you reach the first minimum. Now, if you increase the spectral efficiency by a factor of two, because you're switching from on-off keying to QPSK, in QPSK, you can transmit two bits per symbol, which basically increases your uh, spectral efficiency by a factor of two, because at the same symbol rate you can increase, you can transmit basically twice the amount of information. That's why the spectrum, if you uh, switch from 112 gigabit per second to 56 gigabit per second, each symbol carrying two bits, you end up with a spectrum that's 112 gigahertz wide. And then there's another factor of two if you switch from single polarization to polarization division multiplexing. So you end up with a spectrum that's uh, 56 gigahertz wide. Uh, and if you look at this spectrum, the information is confined in the uh, inner half of this. So the actual transmitted wavelengths or the actual transmitted bandwidth you need is 28 gigahertz. That's why this fits into a 50 gigahertz IDO channel. So bottom line, using advanced modulation and PDM, you can transmit to 100 gigabit per second in a 50 gigahertz IDO channel, and that's what is deployed in many of the networks you see right now. So let's briefly look on uh, how this signal propagates on a fiber, especially in the case of polarization multiplex signal. Standard single mode fiber is not preserving the state of polarization, and so what does that mean if you start out with a polarization X pointing in this direction and polarization Y pointing in this direction? And over the course of time, or along the fiber, the polarization starts to rotate, first to the right and then to the left. So finally, at the receiver, you cannot tell in which direction the X polarization of your signal and in which direction the Y polarization of your signal points. And uh, to describe this effect, to describe the properties of the fiber, you can use the Jones calculus. And I will introduce this Jones calculus in detail in the next slides. In contrast, polarization maintaining fiber, PMF, preserves the state of polarization. But as a matter of fact, uh, today's networks do not have these fibers deployed for transmission of signals. So a very simple example of a uh, few Jones metrics is uh, now presented in the next slides. In this case, we have an ideal transmission channel. So you start out with an X polarization and Y polarization at the transmitter. Then there's an ideal transmission channel. And you have an X polarization and Y polarization at the receiver. So the sent out signals are described by S, X, and S, Y. And the received signals are R, X, and R, Y. And an ideal transmission channel just propagates the S to the R for X and the S, Y to the R, Y for Y. In this case, it's a unitary matrix. And it's a very simple math, of course. It has to note that Sx and Sy are fine dependent complex numbers describing the field, as was introduced previously on the uh, slide around uh, complex modulation. Um, 
it's really describing the field, including the space, not the only, not the uh, optical power only. In this case, where transmitter and receiver frames are aligned with uh, respect to each other, the signals are identical. So there's no need to decouple those. There's no crosstalk between the virtual polarization channels. Now, in case where there's uh, rotation of the polarization, like I described on the uh, slide about um, signal propagation on a signal mode fiber, there's a rotation of the polarization. So you have again starting at the transmitter, the X and Y polarization. But in this case, the X and Y polarization of the receiver is slightly rotated by the angle phi. And uh, the Jones matrix for this propagation is a simple rotary matrix. There's only one independent parameter for this, and you can easily recognize the rotary matrix here. In this case, of course, if you look at the received signal Rx, you see the Sx of the transmitter, and you see a Sy of the transmitter, and they are intermixed. And the angle of rotation uh, describes the mixture of those two signals. However, without the last PDL and PMD, the channel matrix is still quite simple and has only one independent parameter. It's the angle of rotation of the transmitter frame and the receiver frame. If you now look on uh, why do we need to measure field or what's the benefit of measuring field versus measuring the power, uh, if you look at the uh, simple on off keying signal uh, on the S, Y, and S, X channels, there's a 1, 0 on the X channel and a 0, 1 on the Y channel. And then in this case, I have chosen a rotation of 45 degrees. So the receiver is uh, rotated 45 degrees with uh, respect to the transmitter. So the send out signal in black again is rotated 45 degrees with uh, respect to the receiver frame. And in this case, on the Rx of the receiver, you receive the same for both signals because it's always pointing in the same direction. But on the Y channel, you receive uh, 1 over square root of 2 for the 1 of the SY, and minus 1 over square root of 2 for the 0 of the SY. So there's a clearly visible difference in the field measured uh, at the receiver. Now, if you look at the power you would measure using these fields, you don't see a difference because the power is the field times the conjugate of the field. So in this case, it's one half for this combination, and it's one half for this as well because building the power, it's a uh, time six, uh, con con complex conjugate, so it's always a positive number. So in this case, you have completely lost any information. You have the same received signal regardless of what you have sent out at the transmitter. So by detecting the power, the phase of the field is lost. And that's the reason why you cannot resolve any polarization division multiplex signals using power detection in contrast to field detection. Now, if you add loss and PDL to your transmission link, uh, you can easily uh, look at this using this graph. So there's a signal coming in on this polarization and on this polarization, but you have different attenuation constants for those two polarizations. There's an alpha S for this and an alpha P for this. So if you look at the Again, so you have an Sx and Sy as from the transmitter, then there's a rotational matrix because the principal values of the PDL need not be aligned with the transmitter frame. So you have to rotate first the signals to match the, transmitter, uh, the, the PDL uh, principal axis. Then you have the uh, loss and PDL of the two signals. You recognize the alpha S, the attenuation on, the, on one channel, and the alpha P, the attenuation on the other channel. And then again, there's a rotational matrix to rotate uh, the principal axis of the signals to the receiver frame. So in total, you have four independent numbers to describe the channel matrix or the Jones matrix in this case, uh, and PDL. In this case, of course, uh, this drives the orthogonality of the signals. In an uh, worst case, where there is uh, polarizer, then of course, the two signals from the transmitter will collapse to one polarization at the receiver. Now, finally, if you add P and D in addition, and you look at the transmission matrix, you end up uh, using the full Jones matrix, which is a complex value two by two matrix. So there's a total of eight independent uh, real parameters for this Jones matrix. Uh, and that's what you also find in literature. In this case, 
Um, it's a, from, a, from a publication in Photonic Technology Letters, General Parameter Estimation of Polarization Delta Scaling Receivers. In this case, you have a polarization state transformation, which is what we have uh, shown before. But in this case, there's a PMD inside, and of course, you have the PDL in this case. And that's what we are focusing, how we can really resolve uh, the signals if we have these kind of distortions on your transmission. So to really get the standout signals from the received signals, you really have to solve two uh, problems. The first is uh, you need to be able to get an estimate of your uh, transmission matrix, the Jones matrix. And then what you can do, of course, you can calculate the inverse of this Jones matrix, which is uh, this expression. And uh, then using this inverse of your Jones matrix, you can use your received signals multiply it by the inverse of the Jones matrix, and get back, get back to your uh, send out signals from your transmitter. And the second, of course, as I've shown before, you have to measure the field and not the power, so you need to be able to measure the field, and that includes the phase of the field, of course. But again, from this uh, publication, um, what we are looking at, so we have a transmitter, we have the fiber channel, the transmission channel, we have an A to D conversion, and then we have an in this case, a butterfly equalization filter. And we are looking at the simplest form of this equalization filter, which has only one filter tab, and that's the inverse of the channel matrix. That's exactly this expression. And then, of course, you have to do, in case of a coherent receiver, a carrier recovery and decoding of the signals, so you finally get your digital information back. So the coherent receiver is able to detect the field and not only power. So this coherent receiver will solve the problem to measure the field and not the power. So co comparing a coherent reception versus, uh, um, so comparing direct versus interferometer detection. So in direct detection, you have just the optical signal detecting a photodiode. And to measure what the photocurrent of the photodiode puts out, it's quite simple. So you have to just multiply the signal and the complex conjugate of the signal in this case, the signal is just the product of an amplitude term here, which is a real number, and a phase term. And the phase term is split into a static phase and a time-dependent phase, which is the frequency of the signal. And if you do the complex conjugate mod modification, you end up with uh, just the square of the, your signal uh, amplitude. So the field, uh, the phase of the optical signal is lost. So you only measure the optical power. So direct detection does not help you in measuring the phase. If you do uh, inframit detection, then you have a signal and a reference signal. You mix it using a 3 dB coupler, and then there's two photodiodes. And on the uh, photodiodes, you measure on the one photodiode S plus R, so signal plus uh, reference signal times S plus R conjugate, uh, complex conjugate. And then the other photodiode, because of the phase relationship between signal and, and reference signal, you measure S minus R times the complex conjugate. So if you do the math, you end up uh, with a term that has the signal amplitude, the reference signal amplitude, and the phase difference between signal and reference. So if you know the reference amplitude and the phase of your reference signal, you can really uh, get the amplitude of the field and the phase. And that's what, what's necessary to measure the uh, amplitude and phase of your signal. So in a coherent receiver, you have basically two of these um, structures. So there's, again, this interferometric detection up here. And there's another interferometric detection down here. Where there's an additional phase shifter. And this phase shifter allows you to measure not only the uh, in-phase part of the signal, which is this part, but also allows you to measure the quadrature part of the signal. And the difference between those two is that once you have the cosine of the phase difference, and on the other, you have the sine of the phase difference. So you can really recover a full 2 pi of the phase. So we are not yet there at the polarization diversity coherence receiver. That's on the next slide. So in this case, you basically need two of these IQ demodulators, which allow you to measure the in-phase and quadrature part of your signals. And the signal you're sending to these IQ demodulators is the signal split by a polarization splitter. So you have the x-polarization up here and the uh, y-polarization down here. You mix both uh, signal, signals with uh, the same local oscillator, 
So finally, you have four independent terms. So it's the in-phase part uh, for the expolarization, the quadrature part for the expolarization, and the same, the in-phase part for the y-polarization, and the quadrature part for the, for the y-polarization. So this allows you to do a full recovery of the electrical field, which you in turn need to do the polarization demultiplexing, which is uh, the next slide. But before going to general matrix estimation, uh, I will briefly uh, show how this looks in uh, uh, the instrument we have just recently introduced. So what we have down here is, again, the signal, polarization beam splitting, two IQ demodulators or 90-degree optical hybrids. We have a tunable laser source that acts as local oscillator, splitting this into two parts so that each IQ demodulator has its own uh, local oscillator input. And then we have the four balanced receivers, the four balanced photodiodes. Then this goes to, uh, uh, to the A to D converters. And from that, we have to do the digital polarization alignment or polarization demultiplexing. And once we have done that, we can do the digital decoding of the phase modulated signals and show whatever is interesting. So the spectrum, the IQ plot, whatever is uh, interesting for the customer. So in this case, we have, for example, the constellation, the spectrum, and the I and the Q. Uh, I diagrams. And in the instrument, we have uh, basically all the lower parts in the box beneath here. And up here, we have the A to D conversion and all the signal processing. So, Jones matrix estimation is the problem we still have to solve. And there are basically two methods uh, to do this. So, you could either use training symbols or you could do a blind uh, channel estimation. So, what is training symbols? Training symbols are a special uh, piece of information that is sent out from the transmitter, and the receiver knows that there is a special set of information coming in. And by knowing what is coming in, it's easier to do an uh, estimation of your channel. Uh, it's quite efficient, and it's widely used in the RF. Uh, but of course, the receiver needs to know what training sequence uh, is sent out, and there needs to be some synchronization to know when training sequences are really uh, received. Since this method is not yet uh, very, very well standardized or widely used, there's no common training sequence or detection scheme or triggering scheme, so that's not really feasible for a fashion measurement gear. On the other hand, you could do blind channel estimation, which uh, requires to have some prior knowledge about the signal. Um, it does not require prior knowledge about the signal. All you need to know is the modulation format. Uh, it might not be possible to do a full recovery of the information, but uh, we figured that this is probably the better choice for a test measurement instrument. But bottom line is really there is no ultimate solution for the problem as of today. So here's an example of a blind Jones matrix estimation using uh, the Poincaré sphere. So what we have here is uh, sending out a QPSK signal. We have introduced on the slide about complex modulation on the X and on the Y channel. And we're looking at the phase difference that's coming, uh, at the, that's, that's sent out uh, on the X and Y polarization, and what this means for the uh, signal in the, in the uh, Stokes phase, where you can represent the polarization of your signal. So in case you send out a 0, 0 on the X and a 0, 0 on the Y, there's no phase difference between those two signals on the X and Y, those two signals. And the effective state of polarization you're sending out is linear 45 degrees polarized. Same is, of course, true if you send out a 1, 1, 1, 1 on Y. So always, if you send the same signal, the same symbol on X and Y, you have linear 45 degrees polarized light. If you send out different symbol on X and Y, so for this case, a 0, 0 on X and a 1, 0 on Y, there's a pi half phase shift between those two polarizations. So in Instead of polarization, this means you have right circular polarized light. That's, of course, also true if you have a 1, 0, and a 1, 1, or a 1, 1, and a 0, 1. So you have a right circular polarized light for all these symbol combinations. If you send out 0, 0, 1, 1, that's this symbol and this symbol, that's a pi phase shift between the two symbols on X and Y, and you end up with a linear minus 45 degrees polarized light. And the same, of course, if you have 0, 0 on X and uh, one zero, 0, 1 on Y, you end up with a phase shift of minus pi half or plus 3 half uh, 
uh, three pi half. So this means you have left circular light. So in total, you have only four states of polarization coming out of your QPSK polarization multiplex transmitter. And those four states of polarization represented in the Stoke space uh, represent those four points. And those four points in turn define a plane. And the normal of this plane you can use to uh, do an estimation of your channel. Of course, if you send out single polarization light, there's only a single state of polarization. And uh, this single state of polarization can also be used to rotate back uh, your, your polarization in case you have only single polarization coming out of your uh, transmitter. This is, by the way, a real measurement. And you can see that there is other polarizations on the transition from one state to the other. The question is, does that method also work for other formats? And uh, can you use it, or what do you have to do if there's a time dependent Jones matrix which would rotate those states of polarization versus time? So in this case, we have uh, looked into a different uh, modulation format. Here it's a uh, 64-clone um, format. Uh, so it's an example of a higher level clone format. So in 64-clone format, you have eight amplitude levels on the in-phase part of the signals, and you have eight amplitude levels on the culture phase of your signal. And if you look at the states of polarization that can be created using a 64-clone signal on the X and on the Y polarization, you end up in the Stokes space finding these states of polarization. And these states of polarization are in a lens-like object. So there's a, a, always a plane defined by this uh, lens-like object. And the normal of this plane is uh, still defined. And you can use this uh, normal of the plane to uh, do your polarization demultiplexing. So the method, in general, does not depend on your um, Modulation format, so it works for QPSK, but it also works also for 64 common for other polarization, for other advanced modulation schemes. So we have to look into what happens if there is a time dependent Jones matrix. So again, we look at the received signal. There's the inverse of the Jones matrix. This would allow you to get back to the original signal coming out of the transmitter. Um, what you can do then, if you have received these two. Um, signals on the polarization, you can calculate the vector of uh, the received signals uh, to the nearest symbol in your constellation map. And uh, this is basically, you have to define which is the nearest symbol, then you can calculate the nearest uh, constellation. Then you can calculate the vector to the nearest uh, point in the constellation map. And you can use this vector to update the estimate of your inverse chain, uh, choice matrix, of your inverse channel matrix. You can do this iteratively, so you can improve your channel estimation for one symbol to the next symbol. So for this method, you, of course, need to know uh, the constellation map. Uh, the update step, you can tail. You can uh, make it fairly fast. You can make it pretty slow, so that it does not follow any noise. Uh, you can apply additional uh, restrictions for the inverse of the Jones matrix. You have to, uh, of course, worry. You might need to worry about uh, level this for this method converges for a bad initial guess and the locking speed might be slow so you might uh, lose some initial symbols of your transmission. And in the next slides we will uh, look into uh, the decision based estimation how this really works and uh, what results we have uh, found. But before doing that uh, look into uh, the example what happens if there's a large PDL on the transmission channel. So this is, of course, a transmission channel that, that's not uh, working very well, because if there's a large PDL, then, of course, there's an iteration. But how does the math uh, look like for that? And for making things a little bit easier, I've chosen uh, an X-polarizer as the worst case uh, PDL. So in this case, the channel matrix would look like that. So we have only a 1, so only the x polarization is preserved from the send-out signal. And if you do the math, then you would easily see that, in this case, the denominator goes to zero, which means the whole channel matrix diverges and goes to infinity. So you can basically calculate the uh, inverse channel matrix of an uh, polarizer. So you only can calculate the channel matrix for well-behaved channel. That means a channel that has not a very large PDL. 
So we have uh, set up a model to study the decision-based estimation. What we started out again is a QPSK signal, polarization division multiplex. We have again those four sets of polarization as introduced the slides before, and that's a static state of polarization in this case. And by modeling the rotation or the fluctuation of the channel, we have chosen a fairly simple model of two rotating wave plates. And by rotating those two wave plates, we end up with a state of polarization that is moving around. Um, we have only introduced the polarization rotation effects and noise in our model. And the dual wave plates are really the model of the channel of the channel matrix. So what we did is uh, a fast rotation of the channel matrix at 25 mega radians per second. And the constellation before doing any corrections really looks not like any signal. So it's moving around very fast. The state of polarization, it's also moving around fairly fast. Uh, you cannot recognize the four states of polarization you would expect for a QPSK signal. But if you do the uh, correction, then you can uh, recover the, the QPSK signal in the constellation, and you can recover the four states of polarization you would expect for a QPSK signal. Down here we have uh, um, uh, shown the four channel matrix elements. Uh, it's a complex number, therefore we have the in-phase and the quadrature, or the real and imaginary part of the channel matrix element. And you can see that this channel matrix element is moving around versus time. And we have four of those, therefore we have uh, two elements up here on the left side, and we have two elements on the right side. Now if we add some noise uh, to the signal, we still get uh, a nice recovery of the uh, constellation after the correction. We get a nice recovery of the state of polarization after correction, and we still have a very fast rotation of 25 mega radians per second. Where in uh, typical networks right now, you would find only kilo radians per second. Again, we have basically the same um, estimation of the channel parameters, but there's of course some noise that is uh, added to the parameters due to the noise of the signal. If we look into detail, on one of the channel matrix elements, you can look uh, how well this really tracks the uh, theoretical expectation. In this case, we have uh, looked into this um, element of the channel matrix, and the green is the theoretical rotation value we have set, and the, the black dots are the estimated values. And you can even see in the zoomed in see that uh, the channel estimation nicely tracks the estimated uh, channel values. And the estimation, of course, and the noise in the estimation reflects the signal noise ratio of the um, signal. So if you have a good signal, you have a good estimation. If you have a bad signal, then, of course, you would get a, a worse estimation. But you can still track at 28 dB signal to noise ratio a rotation of 25 mega radians per second. What's quite interesting, uh, if you look into the solution, the channel estimation finds um, you see an interesting property. Uh, the channel matrix is, is actually unitary, which means it uh, obeys this relationship. And uh, this relationship basically means that the estimate that the um, power is equal in uh, each polarization channel, so the total power is constant. But in this case, of course, because we have some restriction to the channel matrix, has only four degrees of freedom for the Jones matrix, not eight. So we have to, if we restrict ourselves to finding a unitary matrix, we have only to find four instead of the eight parameters of the Jones matrix. Here we looked into how fast it's uh, locking to a, to a final uh, right estimation of the channel matrix. So we started with a stationary, stationary but misaligned uh, constellation. So the constellation. Uh, splits up into 16 points before the correction, and after the correction, it's again the well-known four states. The state of polarization is again four, but it's not aligned. Uh, after the correction, it's aligned. And you can see that's only a few points outside the uh, right cor uh, the correct estimation, so the estimation is converging fairly fast as only two points until you reach almost the uh, final solution or the final estimation. So even if you have a very poor initial guess, the estimation locks 
very fast to the um, final estimation of your matrix. Now, what happens if you have uh, signals that have a bad signal to noise ratio? In this case, we have a, a signal to noise ratio of about uh, 12 dB. It's a 6 gigabaud QPSK signal. It's a real measurement with a bad modulator. We're looking at 128 kilo samples. So it's a fairly long uh, result. And it's not rotating in any case. So the received uh, constellation looks like noise. There's no structure at all uh, visible. But after the uh, estimation of your channel matrix and after the correction, you can easily see the constellation uh, on the X and on the Y polarization. And the signal to noise ratio of the original signal is recovered using uh, this uh, channel estimation. So the channel estimation works for stationary polarization, even for fairly bad signal to noise ratio of 12 dB. But if you start to apply some rotation on the uh, measurement data, in this case we have applied 25 kilowatt per second, which is already a fairly fast rotation. In the networks you would probably see lower rotational speeds. You still get basically the same received signal on your X and Y polarization. So the general estimation leads to correct demodulation for fairly bad signal to noise ratio and for fairly high rotational speeds. Now here we have a measurement example uh, we did with uh, the instrument, and this is also a snapshot of the screen you can have on the instrument. You can customize the screen. In this case, we have uh, the X polarization in the top row and the Y polarization in the bottom row. So we have the IQ plot, which shows the symbols as red dots and the transition that has green or light blue lines. On the right side, we have the spectrum. So you can clearly see that this is a QPSK spectrum, and the width of the spectrum is roughly uh, the uh, 22 gigahertz you're expecting. The full scale is 26 gigahertz. So we have the same spectrum for the X and for the Y polarization. And in the middle, we have the decoded symbols, which in this case, of course, doesn't make a lot of sense, because there's clearly no consolation, so there's no proper decoding. But as soon as you switch on the demultiplexing, you get uh, a nice constellation for the X and for the Y polarization. And then, of course, the spectrum remains more or less the same. But in this case, the decoded symbols really have some meaning. And in this case, you can also calculate some statistical data, like error vector magnitude, um, quadrature errors, or IQ imbalance, which are statistical data you can extract from the constellation. So the demultiplexing really solves the problem of getting the original signals. If you have only single polarization, then of course the actual data rate is only half of it. So you have only the gain of a factor of two from the QPSK. So it's 21.6 gigabit, gigabit per second. Uh, you have most of the signal coming in into the X polarization. There's only a small portion of the signal coming onto the Y polarization. There's some different algorithm available so that you can basically rotate back the polarization so that all the signal is confined into one channel and you can do all the measurements in this one channel. In the next webcast in this series, uh, we, are, we will describe the quality rating of optical signal using the optical constellation diagram, which is this. And of course, this diagram can be described by a few numbers, as I've pointed out in the previous slide. There's quadrature error, which describes the angular distortion. But more on this topic will be in the uh, next uh, presentation in this series. So to conclude, uh, we have seen that polarization multiplexing increases the efficiency by a factor of two. Uh, the transmission over, sing uh, over single mode fiber leads to cross back of polarization channels. So we need to recover the original signals to in, in order to be able to um, demodulate the signals coming in into the receiver. Uh, for that, uh, we need to have a polarization diversity coherent receiver. And uh, we have to estimate the channel matrix, uh, which we can do using training symbols or blind estimation. The tracking of these uh, changing channels is possi possible using advanced algorithms, namely these decision-based algorithms we have uh, shown before. And instruments, as we have shown uh, some screenshots, are now becoming available. Uh, which include the coherent receiver and the appropriate algorithms to do the channel matrix estimation. And uh, that's the end of today's uh, presentation. I only want to uh, 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 
take your advantage to, 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 to introduce a few more sources of information. You can find out more on the optical modulation analyzer for Matchland under these two websites. Uh, we have recently uh, written a white paper on metrology of advanced optical modulation formats where we are comparing um, coherent detection, frequency domain detection, or delay line informant detection of modulation formats, and we are uh, comparing those, um, showing advantages and disadvantages of all the methods. There's an application note available on the website uh, on digital modulation and communication systems. And uh, if you want to see the instrument on a live demo, uh, we are inviting you to ECOG 2009 in uh, Austria, which is taking place in Vienna this year in uh, autumn. So if you want to have a live demo, just come to ECOG. And uh, finally, um, I want to point out that we are running this in a series. So there are two webcast series. This one is from the low part, be ready for 4000G optical networks and components. And there's another series uh, which is dealing on uh, digital topics like uh, HDMI, uh, PCI, serial ATA. Uh, so if you want to find out more on these, just go to the website and look on under webcast digital or webcast photonic. So I'm coming to my last slide. Next webcast in, uh, on this series will be uh, quality rating of optical signals using the optical constellation diagram. It's uh, three weeks from now. Thank you for watching this Agilent Technologies webcast. For more recorded webcasts, subscribe to our Agilent TM webcast YouTube channel. All of our webcasts are heard live. Interact with our Agilent experts in the live Q&A sessions and gain access to Agilent materials. To view our upcoming live webcasts and to sign up for free, go to our website, www.agilent.com slash find slash web underscore seminar.